Scripture reading for today comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with longsuffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Certainly good to see Dave and Sarah Schaefer back in their spot this morning and both looking and hopefully feeling much better. Go to the other side of the building and to the back and Marge Stacy's with us today. Marge is moving a little slow but still able to be out and we're grateful for that. And Ron and Penny are with us this morning and Ron is looking very good. His treatments are over, his hair is coming back and uh, he's clearly on the mend, and we're thankful for that. Stan and uh, Kathy are back from Florida. I'm glad to see them back home safely. Gary survived his skiing trip out west and is with us this morning. He is going skiing again tomorrow at 70. He's a braver man than I am, but we're glad to see him. If you're visiting with us, we're especially happy you're here. And among our visitors this morning, Mark Harris is with us. Mark has been a friend for a long, long time. His children and our kids are nearly the same age, and uh, he worshiped with the church in uh, Columbus at Fisher and Kenny, where the kids uh, were, until he moved. And uh, he's in the area visiting today, and we're so happy to see him. If you don't know Mark, uh, I urge you to get acquainted with him. I would tell you he'd sell insurance, but uh, he gave that up a long time ago. He's an auctioneer now. He might sell you an antique doll, uh, but we're glad to have him visiting today. The text that Rod read a moment ago, and what a great job he did, focuses on the importance of maintaining the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace and reminds us that that unity rests on a solid foundation. There's one body and one spirit, even as you're called and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father who is above all, through all, and in all. And I believe that you, like myself, understand the power of that passage and the importance of the message that is contained therein. But I am not as confident that our religious friends and neighbors share our convictions relative to the things that are set forth in that brief text. I want to share some things this morning from Scripture regarding the church, and I'm going to use as an illustration something that occurred uh, almost 11 years ago, in fact, 11 years ago, uh, in February, the death of Matthew Winkler. I did not know Matt. I knew his grandfather, Wendell, somewhat well. had met his father on occasion. But on Wednesday evening, he did not show up for Bible class in the congregation in Tennessee where he labored. Following class, uh, the elders, worried that something clearly was amiss, went to the home and found him lying on his bed with a gunshot wound to his back. We learned in the subsequent investigation that his wife Mary had pulled the trigger. Matthew was dead, and to this day I can't understand it. Certainly can't justify it, but it put the church in the spotlight. And one of the shows that highlighted this for months, actually, was the Nancy Grace show, the only time in my life that I can remember watching Nancy Grace was during the events that uh, 
followed Matthew's death. It did put the church in the national spotlight and not, as you might imagine, in a very favorable way because generally those who were consulted knew less about the church than most anything else but did not hesitate to speak out confidently and boldly regarding what they did not know. Result in a lot of misinformation. If you are uh, familiar with the story, you probably know the kinds of things that came out of uh, this particular show uh, when she interviewed a Baptist minister by the name of Tom Rukala, and you will find that spelled uh, with an H on occasion, R U H, but uh, this is the most frequently used spelling of the man's name that I've encountered. In the course of her interview with him, uh, the following charges were leveled against the church. First, Mr. Ucala said the Church of Christ was founded about 150 years ago in America by Thomas Campbell. He said of us and congregations of the Lord's Church all over this nation and around the world, they are a cult or certainly have cult like characteristics. He further said they believe that they're the only ones going to heaven and they believe that anyone who is not baptized by one of their preachers is lost. That was followed up with this, Jim. Their preachers have a reputation for being very ungracious. I took that one personally. And then they, meaning churches of Christ, reject the universally held doctrine of salvation by grace through faith and demand baptism for salvation. Now, I know it's been 11 years since all of this transpired, but these are ideas that are still very prominent in the world and even in our own community. You may not hear all five of these charges leveled, but you're going to hear one or more of them in the course of your conversations if you talk to people at all about faith and the church and what the Bible actually teaches. So I thought it would be good just to address the charges that are leveled against us in that interview and point out what the scriptures actually say and what all of us know to be true and the assertions that uh, Mr. Rukala made were not true. They're not true in relationship to how we conduct ourselves as Christians and they were not true in relationship to the church that you read about in this wonderful book. So let's begin. Who founded the Church of Christ? Alexander Campbell lived from 1788 to 1866. He was the son of Thomas Campbell. And to my knowledge, he founded Bethany College in the panhandle of West Virginia. He founded the Millennial Harbinger, a paper which he produced for a number of years. But I can tell you with absolute certainty that he did not found the Lord's Church. In Matthew 16, from verse 13 through 18, Jesus engaged his disciples in a conversation in which he raised two pertinent questions. One, who do men say that I the Son of Man am? And their response was, men say you're John the Baptist, you're Jeremiah, you're Elijah, you're just one of the prophets. And then he turned to the twelve and said, Who do you say that I am? And Peter spoke for all twelve. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus commended the confession saying, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. That is, you didn't learn this from men, but from my Father. I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, your confession of my deity, I will build my church. If you want to know who built the church, Jesus himself built it. And when he made that statement, it was yet future. In fact, the church does not exist in a single one of the four Gospels except as a future occurrence. It is not until Acts chapter 2 that the writer Luke, the historian of the early church, closes the second chapter following the events of Pentecost by saying, and the Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. 
until that point, the church did not exist. But from Pentecost to the present, the church of Christ is alive and well, and it was built by our Lord when he gave his blood to purchase it. Read Ephesians chapter 5, where Paul contrasts the relationship of Christ with his church and a husband with his wife. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. To illustrate pointedly, saying that Alexander Campbell founded or built the church of Christ in America is like saying Johnny Appleseed founded the apple tree. It makes just as much sense. If you look at the parable of the sower and the seed in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you'll discover that in those three accounts, the record of Luke 8.11 specifically says, and the seed is the word of God. And what do we know about seed? A principle that was established in the beginning, Genesis 1.26, every seed produces after its own kind. If we plant a certain seed, we will produce a certain crop. Corn always inevitably produces corn. And tomatoes will always produce tomatoes. You will never, never pick cucumbers from corn stalks. Or harvest tomatoes from green bean vines. Seed produces after its own kind. And the seed is the word of God. If we plant the same seed that Peter planted at Pentecost, we will result in the same fruit. You know, Mr. Ricola and those who share his views reject the message of God's word that Peter proclaimed. They cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Some will say, well, that may have been true then, but it's not true now. But go on in the text. And he said, the promise is to you, to your children, to all that are afar off. The seed planted that day resulted in about 3,000 souls being baptized and born anew into the family of God added to his church. We plant that seed today, we will see the same result. It's a false charge. I am not a member of a church founded by Alexander Campbell or John Smith or any other man. If you're a Christian, you're in the church that Christ founded at Pentecost, which he purchased with his own blood. Now what about this idea that we're a cult and that we use coercion and unethical tactics to make converts? Is there anyone here today that was forced to obey the gospel? Is there anyone who had their arm twisted to be baptized? Was anybody drug into the building and shoved under the water? Or do you know anybody that has ever encountered that? Now, a cult might do that. But my friend, the Lord's church never was, is not, nor will it ever be a cult. Faithfulness to Christ precludes those kinds of methodologies. You see, it's a strictly whosoever will let him come. Matthew chapter 11, Come unto me, Jesus said, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He did not force himself on anyone, but he stood with outstretched arms, beckoning, come. In that beautiful analogy in Revelation, Jesus is depicted as knocking on the door, asking to be let in. He doesn't break it down. He doesn't force his way in. The door only opens from the inside. The door obviously represents the hearts of men. We must open our heart and invite him in. He will never break that door down and force himself on anyone. In Revelation 22, 17, it's whosoever will let him drink. No one is compelled. And to this day, and I have been in the Lord's church all of my adult life, I've never known anybody to be forced to do anything they did not want to do. You're wondering what the Kool-Aid is about, I know. Jim Jones in Guyana, they drank the Kool-Aid. Over 700, that's a cult, ladies and gentlemen. 
we are not a cult. It's meant in a derogatory sense for a religion regarded as unorthodox or false. And yet everything we teach and everything we do, we can give a thus saith the Lord for. If being faithful to Christ and his word makes us a cult, I will wear that as a badge of honor. But that's not the way the word is generally used. And in the way it is generally used, we do not in any sense meet the definition. It's just a false accusation which is repeated over and over and over again. In fact, I have in my study a library that resulted, or library, in my study a letter that resulted from uh, an, a radio program I did several years ago on WMOA. A gentleman in McConnellsville took great exception to the particular message he'd heard. His response was, the Church of Christ is just a cult and all they talk about is the church and baptism. And I don't know why you're letting them on the air. And Johnny wrote, they're one of our best and longest uh, customers. We're glad you're listening, but they're going to stay on the air. And I appreciated that response, by the way. He went back and listened to the tape and said, there's nothing here but Bible. And that's the fact. But it's also a fact that a lot of people don't want the Bible. Do we believe that we're the only ones going to heaven? I can't speak for everybody, obviously. But I'll tell you, I can speak from Scripture and from experience. I obeyed the gospel when I was 16. I'm almost 66, if you care. And I wear a size 17 shirt. 36, 37 sleeves. Just kidding. <laughs> I've never heard this in all of my life. I've never heard anybody say, if you're not a part of the Church of Christ denomination, you're going to be lost. But surely we would all agree, if you're not a part of the church, you don't have salvation because all the saved are in the church. But I didn't say that. That's what the Lord says. And furthermore... Our emphasis is never on who. It's not my place to decide who will be in heaven and who will not. That is the prerogative of our God. We leave that to Jesus. Remember the parable in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, when he will come with his angels and, and he will separate the sheep from the goats? He will do that. I won't, you won't, no other man. He is the judge of the living and the dead. Therefore, Paul said, the foundation of God stands sure having this seal. The Lord knows them that are his. Let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Go back to Luke 8, 11 and acknowledge that the seed is the word of God. Does it matter who plants the seed? No. Doesn't matter who plants the seed, it just needs to be planted in good soil, a good heart, and it'll do what God designed it to do. I don't know everybody out there planting seed today, and I can't begin to know everyone in whom that seed has taken up residence and grown and brought forth fruit, and I don't need to know. I keep a record of every wedding and every funeral I do. I think I've told you this. I can tell you where every person's buried that I have had the funeral for. And the funeral home and the cemetery and all of that. But I don't keep any records of baptisms. Let the Lord do that. And I only keep the other because someday somebody might say, you know, I think you had uh, my father or my grandfather's funeral and I don't have a clue so I go back and look at my records and it helps me. But uh, when it comes to who is and who isn't, that's all God's prerogative. I'm not interested in making those determinations. The church has never been about the who. It's always about the what because we know who is really in control. Paul in Romans 14 raised this issue. Who are you to judge another man's servant before his own master? He will stand and fall. You don't have to give account to me, folks. 
but you will ultimately have to give an account to God, to the Son of God, to the judge of the living and the dead, who never makes an error, who will always get it right and get it right the first time. Our goal is to be, to the extent possible, everything he calls us to be with an understanding that we will never measure up completely. He set the perfect example and no matter how hard we try, we will never reach perfection. But we love him as he loved us. Our goal surely ought to be like him. And when we stand before him as our judge, You can be sure he'll do what's right with us if we've done what's right with him. In Mark 9, the disciples came upon somebody casting out demons in the name of Jesus and they didn't know him. They wanted to rebuke him and Jesus forbid it. How could he cast out demons except by the power of God? You don't need to know everybody because God knows everyone who belongs to him. We are not about who. That's God's prerogative. Our focus is on what is right. What saith the Lord? Must one be baptized by a Church of Christ preacher to be saved? That's just ludicrous. I don't care who immerses you. If you have heard, believed, and desire to obey Jesus, your faith is real, your repentance is genuine, your confession is is clear then your immersion will wash away your sins and it doesn't matter who does it Alexander Campbell himself was immersed by a Baptist preacher by the name of Matthias Luce June the 12th 1812 and yet the charge was that we don't think any baptism is valid not done by a Church of Christ preacher and I hate those air quotes but it just seemed appropriate It's just another false charge. And we never have embraced apostolic succession. We don't believe that we have to trace our roots all the way back to the apostles to be valid in the eyes of God. We simply have to go back to the book and be faithful to our Lord. And We don't worship the Bible, ladies and gentlemen. But we cannot worship God acceptably if we do not know his will. And we cannot know his will if we do not know his word. And this is his word. That's why it is the book. Now, do preachers in the church of Christ have a reputation for being very ungracious? That guy's about to climb down Tim's throat. Can't you just see it? He's pointing right at Tim and saying, you need to, you're just a scoundrel. Now, I've heard some ungracious things from the pulpit. I've heard preachers say, If you don't understand that, you ain't got the sense God gave a goose. It was designed for a laugh. I don't find that funny. In fact, it can be hurtful. Things that are very clear and plain to us may be very hard for somebody else who doesn't have the same background to understand. And to insult them for being unable to understand it, in my judgment, doesn't really serve any special purpose. Yeah, some people may be ungracious. And it's not just a problem that may be true of preachers, folks. That could be true of any Christian. But what does God demand? First and foremost, that we preach the truth in love. I know that there are times when I say things that some people find offensive, that may even hurt. But they're never said to be offensive. The intention is never to hurt anyone. But the gospel has a way of pricking the heart and conscience. We blame the preacher when in fact it's not the messenger, it's the message that we're really upset with. I can't make the gospel of Christ inoffensive to people who find it offensive. Jesus was the master teacher. Never man spake like this man, John 7, 46. When he finished the Sermon on the Mount, they marveled for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And what ultimately did they do to the master teacher? They nailed him to a cross. Not because he was offensive or vile or malignant, 
because they did not like his message. And we cannot tailor the message to the audience. The message of God's book is designed to tailor us, to make us into the people God calls us to be. Thus, this beautiful text in Ephesians 4 closes with these words, Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Everything that comes from this pulpit, everything that we present in class, is out of a desire to love God and to love one another with our whole heart fervently. Next Sunday morning, Harry will be preaching both at our morning and evening assemblies. And I know he'll preach the truth and he'll preach it in love. But I can't tell you he won't offend you. Probably less likely to than I am. But I still know he'll preach the truth in love. We're not ungracious. We're not unkind. We're not mean-spirited. We just want to be faithful to our God. We cannot honor him if we do not respect his word. Don't you think that even leveling this charge is itself ungracious? Maybe we would all be better served if we would stop looking at others and be a little more inwardly focused. And that's exactly what Paul urges the church to do in 2 Corinthians 13.5. Examine your own selves. Prove your own selves whether you be in the faith or not. Do some honest soul searching this morning. Are you a Christian? The seed has been planted in your heart many, many times. I know that. But have you let it germinate, grow, and ultimately bear fruit? Are you still arguing with the demands of the Savior? You say, I believe, but I, I can't obey. I, it makes no sense. Well, it makes sense because God says it does. We believe that salvation is by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God, but not a gift without strings attached. Not a gift without responsibilities. Not a gift without a response. He has offered. We must accept, and we do so through faith, repentance, confession, and immersion. It does not end there. That's the beginning, the new birth. For now, we strive every day to be more and more like our Savior, to be a light in this community, the church that Jesus bled and died for, living and proclaiming his message from this pulpit and from every place we go by word and example. And when we do that, God will bless our efforts. And you need to be a part of that process to save your soul and to let God use you to save others. And we invite you to be a part of the church that Jesus built, purchased with his blood, began at Pentecost, and to which all of the saved are added daily. Don't you want that? And then to hear him, who is the judge, say in that last day, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of your Lord. There are no words more important no words more comforting. May they be said of all of us someday because of him. Tim selected the song of encouragement. We invite you to come now.